Well, hi, this video is all about my Project Transatlantic Glide, the thinking behind the design, inspiration where it all fits in with my other projects, some thoughts about artist statements, which you may find uh, a little bit useful, and a little bit of a co-review at the end where I'm going to break down one of the elements that's sort of in there for those people who like that type of thing. Also, I'm going to try to keep this nice and short, and I'll pop some outputs up over there for the next bit because one bit of eye candy just isn't enough. Anyway, let's start with the Origins bit. So we'll come back to the older versions later, I'll show you those. But this project came out of a collaboration with where we're bouncing ideas back and forth, and one of them was all about perspectives. The idea that you had this scene, but the perspective, the, the angles kind of shifted back and forth in the in the different planes of the design, the foreground and the background. We explored several pathways, but for various incredibly dull reasons, we just can hit our stride with it. And I think it's because the deliverable was supposed to be the collaboration rather than the art. The platform was like, we need this thing and it needs to be a collaboration between you two. And the way we both work is kind of finding someone that you gel with. And we did gel. And then the collaboration is sort of a by the by. The art is the final thing. Anyway, one of the designs kept bouncing around in my head, which turned into this. And I wanted to make a drop for my birthday because, you know, why not? I'll be 52. So I figured an addition of 52 would be nice. And maybe next year I'll do 53 and so on until... I die. So why Alba? Now I think some kind of consistency of platform use is useful for not only myself but also my collectors so they don't have to go looking around absolutely everywhere to find out what I'm doing or what I'm doing next. So if we look at this, this is how I see it. So Alba here is, I think its design is very print focused. Even though it's open, they have galleries and curation and things like that. So Falling Water, 81, 82, 83, 84, and then Transatlantic Glide are very kind of print orientated projects. I'm hoping they work as print Alba should have a print service online soon so you can order those. So that's Alba and that's why this one's going here. Art Blocks and Art Blocks Engines, that's where the 70s Pop Series 1 and 2, the bonus packs and 80s Pop lives. 80s Pop Roxy, Pop 95, Pop 2K will be living on Art Blocks Engine and then 70s Pop Deluxe is hopefully here but maybe on here and that's a whole series there. I want that collection of work to be on art blocks and they do really well there they're kind of fun projects that that people like so they that's where that lives and then over on fx hash this is my sort of my more various experiments and then post photography type of stuff lives here and those are the three main platforms that's where you'll find me other things will be going on to foundation with art for and that's like pen plotting and non-print prints so screen prints wood blocks things like that anything with a physical thing that isn't just a standard print is going to go on there and maybe some stuff with highlight xyz and verse and then other platforms there so even though i'm saying trying to have consistency this is it 70s pop print stuff experimental other print stuff pen plots and then maybe long form artist created over on that type of thing Hopefully that makes sense. I'm not trying to have a scattershot approach where I'm launching on all the new things all the time and lots of very similar projects are spread across different platforms. These are kind of my, my verticals. Anyway, let's get on with the design. It's probably easier to look at those very first early designs. So it started with this, which is pretty plain. And yes, I did save this one for archival purposes, uh, then a grid and some with some added perspective to it and then going both ways an alternating grid with depth and then also going both ways, then knocking some of them out to bring the negative space back in. Next was playing with having two layers with the same size grid, but with different squares knocked out and going into directions. It's not easy to see what's going on here, but what it actually is, that circle is actually a hole. So in this one, there's you have a full blue background and then a mask is applied, which protects that background. And then the magenta layer is drawn over the top with different squares. So that blue you're seeing, that's actually like through a hole that's cut into the magenta. Now you have some places where the squares are going in the same direction and they match exactly on both layers, like these three spots here, which adds a little confusion because the circle, which is actually a hole, looks like it's behind those squares. So you have this depth perception thing going on. We'll come back and play with this a little bit more later. Then I switch to a different color method. This color scheme is a cut down version for my twins project that I have on FX hash. I have a video about that that goes into the artwork a little bit more, probably a link up there. This is a very short version of that. I asked AI to generate red painting and then yellow painting and so on. And you can see the help that's over here. Because the AI is trained on like 
all images, you end up with like a, a universal composition of, for that painting. So when I'm drawing a yellow square in our design, it's like 25% of the way across and 50% down, we'll pick that colour for one of the four source images. If you imagine the source images were all generated with a prompt, like green field with blue sky, then our design here would reflect that. There will kind of be green fields at the bottom and blue at the top. Or I could say 70s psychedelic movie poster or 80s sci-fi poster, and that way I can control the palettes without having to resort to predefined ones or code generated ones. Now, because this all lives on the ETH blockchain, it would cost too much to put those images on the chain. So I have some code here that reads in those images, extracts the values at certain points, and then puts them into a new file like this. That all gets bundled up in my project along with another file which handles unpacking the data, getting the colour from XY positions, and then flipping those XY positions. So it's giving me consistency across the whole series, and it's also the type of colour palettes used for for old book covers from 50s and 60s, specifically Penguin books and Pelican books, which I think has stopped and come back. I'll see if I can find an example to put up there, so hopefully there's one there now. Now, I'm going to make a more in-depth video about artist statements at some point, so I'm going to skip over the artist statement bit quite a lot, but there's this part right at the start. Taking inspiration from the clean functional grid system of Swiss style and the abstract nature forms strong colour principles of late modernism. I think it's important to avoid art speak in artist statements. You don't want to be too basic, but you also want to cover both types of people. People who have knowledge of graphic design, in this case, and then people coming to the work com completely fresh and no knowledge of this. So here I could have said, inspired by Swiss international style and late modernism, which would have been true. Some people will get the reference, but, but most people won't. Instead, I've got from the clean functional grid system of Swiss style, so you don't need to know Swiss international style because it says I'm taking the grid system from there without going too deep into it. And then the abstract nature of forms and strong colour principles of late modernism. Again, you don't need to know what late modernism is, and even if you do, I've said which small set of elements I'm taking from it. I'll pull one more thing from the statement, which is my references to designers, and I'm highlighting Hanson here hope I pronounced that right, and I've included links at the end of the statement so you can go dig in a bit more. If you get a chance, go view Stig's Instagram page, particularly his book and poster redesigns, where he's taking an existing design from a cover, recreate it in code, which is a method he uses to teach programming principles to graphic designers, deconstructing a design, understanding the rules, and then reconstructing it in code. So his stuff is great, go check it out. All right, I think we're at about 10 minutes, depending how I edit this. We've already talked about the circles here that are actually holes and about the colour. So let's talk about the design elements. So first off, I wanted to move from square, which we've seen before, to this 4x5, which gives us this space down here. And throwing away all the lessons I've learned from Swiss international style and late modernism, I want to throw more stuff in there instead of having it fairly minimal, although I do like this. So that gives us these squares down here and then these circles up here. So focusing on these squares, I've used this square motif here, which is along the edge a little bit before. It's a bit minimal here, but that's encoding a little bit of information. And then also on these album cover designs, these generative album cover designs, where I've got these down here, which is encoding information. And this is a smaller version of this, which is basically encoding the whole hash there. So I'm doing a similar thing, a sort of similar thing with all the squares down at the bottom of the design. And then over here in uh, Rudolph's book here, this design here, these circles, these are the inspirations. I wanted something similar sort of up on the right hand side here and we'll talk about the code for this at the end. So again it's not necessarily obvious but while these squares here and these ones here are different going in different directions, these squares are repeated but they're borrowing the colours from each other so you can't tell that one's actually behind the other. It just changes that circle moves over it. And a lot of generative design is having this a vast space of randomness so having those things like the colours linking between layers brings the consistency back down. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Now, I said I'd explain the title. My previous collection was called 81, 82, 83, 84, uh, which is a fantastic track from Simple Minds, probably one of the best singles in the 1980s. And it was covered by the Utah Saints and on the same album as that, it's a track called Transatlantic Glide, which I think matches the design and the movement of the circles moving around really well. So the link is up there to the track, so go put that track on, then visit the artwork page on Alba, which the link is below, Hit the random button a few times and see if you agree that the, the motion of the design kind of matches the music 
I think it does. So that's what I've gone with. Anyway, we're done. I hope that helps you understand the collection a little bit better. Those of you who want to stick around for extra class credits, I'll go over a little bit of the code. For the rest of you, I am Dan Cat, contemporary print artist and studio manager. Hit me up with any questions in the comments and I'll catch you in the next video. Code. Okay, this part is for the code people and we're going to be talking about the circles. So here are the rules. Along the right hand edge here, we have seven circles. Well, almost. The code starts with the bottommost one and then it works its way up with the first five circles having like a, an 80% chance of showing up. Those two at the top, they only have a 30% chance of showing up. Each of those rows is not equal because sometimes I want those ones to show up, but, but not quite as much as the lower ones. For graphic design reasons, let's say. Also, I hate recursion. I hate debugging it. I hate working with it. I hate stepping through it. I hate logging from it. But sometimes we have to use it. But to make my life slightly easier, we're going to be using messy recursion by having a global array here that holds the circles. And globals are bad, but in this case, I don't care. So down here, before I start working with the circles, I'll empty out the array. I'll explain why in a tick. So what happens when we call our make circle function? Well, we make a circle and we push it into an array. Then if we're not the first circle or the last circle, there's a 33% chance we'll make another one directly below. Then we're going to rotate it around the parent one, sort of either 30 degrees one way or the other. And then if it's not overlapping, we'll check against all the other circles. So that's one benefit of having the global array that you put things into rather than proper recursion where you sort of calculate everything and then pop everything in as you go back. It allows us to do this. Anyway, if there isn't any overlap, we'll shove it into the array, marking the current depth. And if it's wonky or not, when it's been adjusted, then it counts as wonky. And there's a reason for that we'll get on to um, in a tick. And then there's another 33% chance that it'll make another circle below it and then below. So in theory, you could keep going down, 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 and then adjusting them as you do that. At some point, you won't make a new circle. So you start going back up and then you have a 66% chance of making another one directly to the left and then again and then again, so you keep going that way. And then each one of those could have one below it that goes down. So that's kind of, we're going down, coming back, then the next, then the next, maybe going down, coming back. And once we've done the whole of that row, we move up onto the next one that'll go across. But the chances are, if it starts going down, there might be one underneath. So that's why we're starting at the bottom and working our way up. Once we've made all our circles, we'll count the total of them and then the number of wonky ones. If we have more than 14 circles and more than four wonky ones, then, then we're good. But while loops can be kind of tricky, so we also have this escape counter. If we've just tried this like a thousand times, so we still haven't got the right number, we just accept our fate and move on. I don't think I've ever hit that thousand today in my testing. So one last thing, if we're good, if we have more than 14 and more than four wonky ones, but we also have more than 21 circles, that's too many for the design, it's, it's too heavy. So we'll start randomly deleting them out of the array until we're left with 21. And that can kind of give us gaps, which is also kind of interesting. And all of that is in there because we don't want to leave things completely to chance. Otherwise you might just end up with two circles or we could have this, this growth of all these circles. So we want to control the randomness but controlling it in the logic inside the decision about what to do is too complicated. So it's easier just to keep throwing it out there until we have one that matches our criteria. It keeps the code simpler. Anyway, that's just like a small bit of the code, but I thought it was interesting to go over that element for like maybe a little bonus code overview. Maybe you found it useful, who knows? Right, onwards, I love you all. I'll see you in the next video, bye.